hear shrieks and, and kind of a commotion, and I was kind of half partially turned around, and when I heard that, I turned around, and that's when the second plane hit. And so I'm looking at the hole in the first tower, but I can see the second tower, clear as day. And that same thing, massive fireball. I didn't see the first fireball, I felt that. This one, I saw it, I felt it. And in fact, I remember distinctly, um, I learned later what it was, and you can see in this picture, um, where the kind of the red lines are going out, that's um, landing gear and engines, where they landed. I mean, some of those things landed on people. And so, let's see if I can get this pointer going. So you see several will train on the bottom right and the Verizon building there. I'm standing here, my coworkers, and we ran upon impact to here, right behind several will train. And so we've now got, so that's the second time I had to run. And what's really hard is that's when my life changed. First one, it's generator. These things happen. I explained it very simply. Um, and, then, and then I realized it was much more than that. And a woman who just started working for me a couple of days before, she was commuting from the Jersey Shore. So I don't know how many people, I mean, that is an hour 45 commute if nothing goes wrong. But she wanted to work in the city. She thought it would be fun. She was the nicest person in the world, and she was like, yeah, this would be great, good change of pace. Her second day, she's, she's hanging on my arm. She's really, I mean, she wasn't standing very well. She was really shook, and she said, Billy, I saw it. And, and I'm like, what did you see? And she's like, I saw a plane turn into the World Trade Center. She said, I, or it was a missile or a plane. I saw it. And I said, I said, yeah, I trust, oh, okay. I said, I don't know what it was, but we're getting the hell out of here. And we're gonna go up to the office at 388 Greenwich, and we're gonna go in there, and we're gonna figure out what's going on, and we're gonna call our families and let them know we're okay. So, it's probably 10 of us, and we're walking up uh, a very familiar path, half mile, we get to 388 Greenwich, and guess what's happening? Everyone's leaving. No one's gonna stay in skyscraper, no one's gonna stay in a tall building. So everyone is evacuated. And this was, this was just a reminder of, you know, where is this gonna end? So if it's intentional, who's to say that they're not planning other stuff? Who knows? So now, my brain is so far off equilibrium, I can't think right. And it's just swinging, you know, back and forth. And that was one of the things I really learned about myself through this, and I guess a lot of people, is how you deal with, deal with things like that. But I was, um, yeah, it was heavy. But what are you gonna do? All right, new plan. Now we have an office at 34th Street. And so 34th Street's kind of where Empire State Building is. Um, so, uh, yeah, it was roughly. So we go, we're, it's about three miles away, maybe three and a half miles away. But what are we going to do? Like, start walking. So I'll, I'll spend some time telling some stories about that kind of path from uh, on, on our kind of mission to get to uh, 34th Street. But maybe I'll stop and see if there's any questions kind of on the, on the initial impact. Yes? I, I remember there was this uh, enormous cloud of smoke and debris that rushed up the streets. Is that no body that was involved in that building? Yeah, yeah. I've kind of lost. Oh yeah, so actually, um, let's first do the video of the impact. Which, sorry. I got on a roll. Alright, now on the emergency line, please take the emergency. This is the first one. Somebody stabbed in this club. And um, I think they're late. 
that we can't read. I, I don't know. I think we can type that. Okay. 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 Yeah, so when I saw that video, it was two days after, I think. And so I'm starting to get my equilibrium back a little bit. I saw that video and I was a basket case. I was sobbing on the bed. I and, I, and, and it was because I always felt like I just got, I just left. So I didn't see the cloud. You know, I got out, ran around the back, second plane hit, I ran away. <laughs> And uh, so by the time the second plane hit, I was further, or sorry, by the time the, the, um, the, the uh, building fell, I was mile, uh, probably a mile, mile and a half away. Didn't see it, didn't hear it. I will tell you how I did come across it though. But um, yeah, any other uh, questions? Yes. That video that was just shown was taken by a out of country, I think an English film crew that was shadowing the FDNY company and they were on a job a couple blocks away and he's running raw video of that and that's how it got captured. So exactly right. And I almost think if there's one documentary to watch, it's actually French, it was uh, French filmmakers, but you're exactly right. They were embedded with the firefighters. It's the <laughs> most incredible coincidence and they are in the buildings as stuff is all as the buildings like are coming down, right? So the next building next door is coming down, and they're running through. And there's no lights. It's unbelievable. Um, and I'm talking about like real heroism and, and such. They captured it, and so that's a that's probably my number one documentary I like to, to watch. Okay. Yeah, so as I said, that's, I was, that was my view, <laughs> but from the ground. I'm going to the next one. So this is, you know, Jerry really helped me with these slides so much, and I like storytelling, and I forgot the slide, so apologies. <laughs> so you can see, so now on the right, what's illuminated there is the path, the lighter blue line is roughly my walk to get up to 34th Street, and then you'll see it kind of makes a left turn, and I'll explain where I go after that. But that was the day. So the day was, we need to get out of here, we need to call our families, and figure out what the heck's going on. Oh, question, yes. It's a great question, and um, no, we just, I mean, some people just left. Uh, I figured I'd be going up to my office later that day, right? One plane, one generator had blown out at that time of my life when I left the office, and my buddies who were track stars running down the hallway, like George Costanza running from a fire, like, they weren't, they didn't stop for anything. They were just out of the way. But I have to say, I have another friend who went upstairs to the gym, and it's all glass, and he was there, I think through the, um, certainly through the second one hit, the second plane hit, and he was just gawking at the horrific scene that was there. And so some people felt, I'm getting out of here on impact. Some people felt like I initially did, which was, Oh, this is incredible. Look at this. Right? So, but I say by and large, people left their stuff. In fact, I had to drive some people home uh, because they left their car keys. Other questions? Okay. So, so we're making our way up, and New York is basically dry cleaners, nail salons, 
Irish pubs, repeat. And so we just wanted a phone. I, I didn't have a cell phone. We had one in the family. My wife had it. She had kids. Okay, I don't, what do I need one for? None of our group, uh, actually one guy in the group had one. Didn't work. Cell phones did not work. Landlines weren't working. Pay phones weren't working. But we went in, I remember the first um, dry cleaner we stopped in. And usually if you go to New York City dry cleaner, it's all about efficiency. They'll be nice enough, but they may or may not know the language, and they're still not going to, they're going to act like they don't. They're just like, drop your clothes, get out, because there's a line, and so it's a factory. So I feel like the first one, I remember being sheepishly like, hey, would you mind, can we try using your phone? Like, can we, back in the office, you got a phone? And they were like, come on in. Here, use this phone. Oh, there's another one over there. Try my cell phone. And they were just bending over backwards. So now I'm kind of like, this is almost scary because New Yorkers being nice like this. It was very, it was very off-putting. Sometimes when I come back to Rochester, I have the same incident where I'm all wound tight. And I'm like, wait, they're just being nice to me. And I'm like, oh, okay, I need to relax. But these people were relaxed and they wanted to help. And they were going to give us what we asked for and they would have helped in any way. So we probably did that four or five times as we walked up. Um, the other thing, two, couple things I observed, the, there was police, and there was actually kind of camel, I don't know if they were National Guard or whatever, and they were on towards the West Side Highway, and they were basically shooting people uptown and I think away from the river and away from the highway. And so we're walking up, doing as we're told, and all of a sudden this FedEx truck goes flying the wrong way on the highway. And he's got his, he's, he's beeping his horn, and as he's going by, I see the guy, and he's not like, oh, I'm gonna drop in, throw a package on somebody's you know, front step. He's driving like this, and he is really intense. And I'm like, that's weird, he's driving incredibly recklessly. And as he went past, he had firemen in the back. And one of the guys was putting his boots on. He was, he was not working, but he had to get down with his brothers. And his feet are hanging out the back of this maniac driver's truck, and he's putting his stupid boots on. Not long after, I saw a police officer, he, had a, he was dressed in casual clothes, but he had the um, badge, he had his badge hanging. And I am certain that he had just stolen a bicycle because it didn't fit him. He looked like he did not work. Remember the, uh, the Wizard of Oz when Dorothy's in her bedroom and her house is flying and the, the Wicked Witch is riding the bikes outside the window and she's pedaling really fast and not going anywhere? That was this guy. I'm like, he has some autos. And I realized he stole that bike to run down and go get in, the, get in the battle. I'm scared, I'm going the other way, man. And, and so that's the third time I encountered somebody who lived a different life than I did. And again, through these documentaries, it's, it's unbelievable. You hear firemen going up the stairs full of gear. Guys like, there's nobody up there. We were on the 82nd floor. He goes, it's my job, sir. And he walked up, like, to go put the fire out. And, and so, anyway, seeing those, they're, it's a little microcosm, I think, of the greater story of the police and the firemen's sacrifice, for, from my perspective. But, super heavy, I'll be honest, you can tell the story sometimes. I, you know, I wonder what happened to those guys. Um, but they're just different. So, we're making our way up and we're gonna to get to the 34th Street office. But before we do, we hear this plane, and it's coming down the river, kind of sounds super loud. It's, it's like a, it's super loud, and it feels like it's low, and we're all kind of like, huh, well, it's not a generator. Probably under attack. Are we done? So, I remember, uh, I don't remember if we talked about it, but 
I know myself, I started going like this slowly, and I went over against a wall to one of the buildings, and I kind of crouched down against the wall. And I'm like, all right, Jason Bourne's here, this is what I gotta do. And the plane, it was an F-15 going down the Hudson River. And so we kind of look at each other and like laugh, like, oh, come on, you know. Yeah, sure, it's a generator, bill. Look at you, get off the ground. So, but you're just so fearful of that which could never happen because it happened. The other, the other thing where we were paranoid was, you know, New York, underneath most of the streets, or many, are subways. So, if you know, like, when you walk over a subway, oftentimes there's a grating, and the women know, because you're high heel, you get your, your heel stuck in. It's, it's um, very common. You don't even think about it, for the most part. And we're walking over, and uh, might have been, some, somebody said, wait a minute, don't they talk about blowing up subways? Isn't there every once in a while a story about that? And we're like, yeah, let's not walk up a street that has subways underneath it, which in New York is tough, but, but that was our goal. Again, what's the limit? Where does this go? And so we were just, you know, the time being prudent. Now it's kind of funny, but um, you just don't know how far it's going to go. So we get, it's about almost 10.30, and we get to this diner, and we go in, usual drill. Can we use your phone? They came out as a diner. They gave us each, like, a case of water. They're like, what are you, like, I got a phone here, here's my pay phone, like, carry your patient. Like, they were, they, they could not have wanted to help more. Very limited in how they could help, but they just really um, wanted to. So we tried all their phones, nothing worked, and they're like, do you guys want something to eat? I'm not, whatever you guys want, whatever you want. And again, there's not, I think there's six of us, six or seven this time. And we're like, no, no, no. We took the water, and we're, you know, water each, and we're heading out, we're like, no, no, no. And Sergey says, sure, I'll have a bacon, egg, and cheese on a bagel. <laughs> <laughs> and we're like, now, meanwhile, I mean, you know, I mean, there were senior people there. He was the kid, and the CFO was one of the guys with us. And, and we were all like, search. Like, it's all palms up. We're like, what are, you, what are you thinking? You're gonna eat that now? So we don't know what to do with him. <laughs> Still don't. Great guy, but he was hungry. So, so we go outside and we're standing on the street. Another very unusual thing in New York well, for this day was there was a car parked uh, on, you know, by the edge of the other sidewalk. Doors and windows were open and the radio was playing the news. And what would happen is people were just kind of gathering around this car. And normally it's like, hey man, get away from my car. And this guy was like telling people what he had heard, giving them updates. One of the things we heard was the South Tower had fallen. So Serge is getting his food. South Tower had fallen. And I was looking back down the avenue and I could see the top of one of the towers. And at this time, I didn't know it had fallen, but I could see the top of one of the towers and a blue sky next to it. And I wasn't sure if the blue sky was because it was missing or because it was behind the other building, right? I wasn't sure which was which. We hear on the radio, tower fell. No debris, no dust, none of that. Um, I did have my college roommate was actually in Battery Park City. The dust cloud came and he ran as far as he could to get to the uh, Hudson River and he stood on the edge and he was gonna jump in the river because the cloud was coming. And he's like, I, I don't know what to do here. And he didn't jump, but that cloud was a, a scary thing that I didn't get to uh, experience. So I'm looking at the towers, or the tower singular, and I'm just, you know, it's been a long day already, and all of a sudden, ka thunk ka thunk ka thunk ka thunk All the, um, as you can see there on the left, thank you, Jerry, the, the 
tower starts falling on itself. And I could see the top 25 floors, and they just condensed to one, and then we're out of sight. And I thought, 25,000 people just died. And after a day like that, and I thought about this a lot, even in kind of thinking about it tonight, there's a, there's a limit to how much sadness you can take on. Like, I, I can't comprehend 25,000. Is that worse than 12,000? Yes, but I'm filled up with tragedy. So, obviously, I, I heard somewhere 25,000 people worked at each tower. And so I assumed everybody was sitting at their desk still and yada, yada, yada. So 3,000 people was the number in, in total. But that was my thought. 25,000 people, I just watched die. So time's up for search. We're out. We're like, search, enjoy. He had a different plan anyways. He had family in the city. He was going to break off from us. So search, uh, so Serge eats his lunch, and we're, we make it to 34th Street. I get to uh, I get to 34th Street, and it was kind of an operation, operational area, and so for financial services, it's like trade settlement. So um, real Wall Street guys, not accountant pretenders like me. And my roommate's best friend, who I probably saw twice a week in the bar, he was, I ran into him, I'm like, Craig, how you doing? I go, can you believe this? And he said, they're gone. I'm like, what are you talking about? He goes, they're gone. And I said, and he's not a hysterical guy, he's actually more of a, a laughy, jokey, make fun of you, whatever. And he is ranting and raving, they're gone. He said, we were on the phone with Cantor Fitzgerald traders and they were right in the line, and it's gone, they're gone. We cannot get anybody over there. And I was like, at that time, I'd never heard of Cannon Fitzgerald. I didn't, maybe I had but it didn't really mean anything to me, but, uh, but okay. So I go and I call, um, actually, my wife told me today that I didn't call her. So I, I, I think I didn't get her. But I ended up, I think, speaking to my father. My mother was working at the Red Cross, uh, conveniently enough, because they became uh, heavily in need. And um, I said, hey, I'm OK. Tell people around, I'm OK. I'm going to get the hell out of here. You know, just that's it. Somebody said, all right, well, if you guys are going to Jersey, go over to Chelsea Peters. <coughs> Chelsea Peters. <laughs> so, um, so Chelsea Peters is there on the right, and what are you, it's a sports complex. There's hockey rinks, soccer fields, driving range, marina, all kinds of stuff. It's really, it's a pretty cool place. And so, and you see that you can see on the picture on the right, the Empire State Building in the background. That was roughly where I was, and I had to walk. You know, probably it was like a 10, 15 minute walk, not too bad. And then I ended up getting on one of these dinner ship type of cruise dinner type um, ships. But as we're walking to Grand to, as we're walking to get to Chelsea Piers, I see a line of ambulances beyond where I, like they're, they, they go up the block. I could see 50, 70. I'm not really sure, but they just went as far as I could see right around the corner. And I was like, I just couldn't believe it. I'm like, oh my goodness. This is like real preparation. You know, I'm not the first to give credit to a, a lot of uh, agencies, but somebody had done the right thing and there was people there ready for a mass casualty event. Unfortunately, we didn't have mass casualties, ironically. As I got closer to those ambulances, you know, I saw Queens, Brooklyn, Bronx, maybe Pelham, which is in Westchester County by me. <coughs> and then I go look for it online. It's Pennsylvania, Darien, Connecticut, Suffolk County, New York. And I'm like, these freaking, these people came from, from all over. And they showed up. 
again, it's, it's probably 11.30, something like that maybe. Um, and they, so they show up, they're all waiting there, no one's moving, no one's calling for an ambulance. That's the tragedy of it. We end up going to um, walk through the ambulances, and I see this line for these cruise ships, and it's winding down one pier, back, down the next pier, and back, six people wide. And I'm like, oh man, this is gonna suck. I can't, I'm you know, waiting here all day, I'm never gonna get home. Well, that was like a Walt Disney World line. I never stopped moving. I was on a ship, I don't know, feels like 10 minutes, maybe it was 30 or 40 minutes. But it was fast. Ship had us in New Jersey like that. Felt fast because I'm so appreciative that they had this plan ready and had implemented it. But I don't know where I'm going still. My car's not going to drop me off. I don't know. I don't know. And it was, it's, uh, I think there was, there was two or three, I think it was, there was three of us on the ship at this point, so four in total. I get off the ship and I walk kind of out to where it opens up in the parking lot. Florence Nightingale herself comes over and says, where are you going? And I said, you're train station. And she said, go over there. Get on that yellow bus. It'll take you there. And I was like, just, you know, when you need a little guidance and somebody's there, it's, it's a, I mean, I love that. I don't know, I don't know what she looks like anymore, but I just remember the feeling I had of appreciation for her uh, just being there for me. So me and my friends go, yellow bus, go to Newark train station, and uh, we get in my car. Actually, my mom, it was your car. It was your Honda Accord that I bought from you. Um, it was still running. And I drove my two buddies. The woman who was with us, her husband came up from the Jersey Shore together, uh, if I remember correctly. But I drove two buddies to kind of central Jersey. And by this time, um, well, it had to be five o'clock because we're driving down the turnpike and they lived a pretty good distance south. And all of a sudden, we're listening to the radio, of course, and, and they say, Oh my God, seven World Trade Center just fell. And I remember feeling like a beaten boxer, maybe MMA person, and being laying on the ground and then somebody just kicking you one more time in the gut. Like, who cares? Nobody was in the building. I palm pie that was gone. I just bought this deep little palm pie before they were selling it. To, I thought it was, now I was looking for it easily. Gone. Everything was gone. Never go back there again. Like, no lives were lost. The building had been evacuated. But it was just one more kick in the pants. So, drop my buddies off. I'm home. I, I figure it's probably 6.30. And uh, I walk in, talk to my wife, or according to her, we didn't talk. Uh, I just walked in and sat on the couch in a vegetative state. And, um, and she actually said, as I was telling her about my comments tonight, she's like, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. No, I didn't know that. I, said, I feel like I'm a better communicator than that, but she's probably right. I probably do. But I was beaten, and a lot of people were calling. Jerry Pickett called, right? Um, and uh, so just telling the story over and over. And I've done that since day one. Like this is my, this is the first time I've strung it together for the day, but I have told the story from day one intentionally because um, it, I, I did it for myself, because I wanted to not sit on it, right? So like I said, I was getting choked up before in the hotel room by myself, so. I don't mind doing it. Um, but, uh, so anyways, I'm home, kiss my wife and kids, talk to my parents, talk to my in-laws, and that's when I found out that, um, what Cancer Fitzgerald meant. So, my mother-in-law said, and I'm sure my wife said before, but one down, one to go. And I said, what do, you, what do you mean? Well, Mark is missing, my wife's cousin. 
And she said, yeah, he worked with Cantor Fitzgerald. And yeah, I knew, I knew what that meant. So we go, um, or rather, Mark's brother calls me and says, hey, uh, have you seen Mark? Anything, what can you tell me? And I'm like, I feel so bad, I got I cried and I ran. I ran, I wasn't found them. So, um, this is actually right, so you see good pictures here of my old building on the left. Top right, you can see the sphere, and then you can see the dust cloud. But after all of this, and all that day, I remember my father giving me parental advice. Son, you need to look after your wife. She's exhausted. It's been a long day for her. Blah, blah, blah. I said, Dad, I got nothing. I'm done. I'm just going to sit here. She's sitting here. We have. This is it. We're just going to survive the night. And, um, and that's what we did. And it, it took some time to talk about your equilibrium being off. And that was, um, uh, that's what it was just kind of trying to recalibrate. Um, do you want to, maybe you want to show the, um, the Mark video next? Yeah, yeah. So a couple of after that things, um, quick anecdotes perhaps. Uh, couple one, the smell from the World Trade Center reached my house in New Jersey, 15 miles away, clear as day. Clear as day. And I used to have to walk past the World Trade Center rubble pot. Um, from the early days, it was still simmering because I had to go to work in you know, office downtown. And I remember at that time smelling it going, this ain't good. This ain't good. I could, I'm not a scientist, not an engineer, but I knew this wasn't good. And people were out there, no masks or cheap masks, and um, it, it, it's a shame, but it reached our house. And one of the things that I feel what really bothered me personally a lot, and, you know, how did you change or whatever? I was so fearful of stuff, and I hated that. I hated that. I was mowing my lawn, and all of a sudden I hear a plane approaching. And it's not like, I mean, we were by Newark Airport. It, it clearly wasn't some high-flying mega jet. It was low and fast, and I'm cutting my one-tenth of an acre property, and this thing keeps getting louder and louder, and I'm kind of going like this. A friggin' F-15, I feel like it buzzed the tops of the trees. It was probably 150 feet up, or maybe even 400. It felt like it was top of the tree. I'm on the ground, on my hands and knees, turn the lawnmower off, go in the house, go lay down like I was petrified. And this was, this was days later. A couple weeks later, I go out to the parking lot, and I'm looking in the back seat to make sure nobody's in there. What? I don't do that. What? That is nuts. And I was, and, and that stuff was frustrating me at first. So we talked to a, uh, a counselor, and she talked about how that equilibrium, that pendulum. She's like, you guys, you're going to experience things. You're going to cry for no reason. You're going to laugh for no reason. You're going to be angry for no reason. And, and. She's like, it's just your brain is so out of whack. It's going to take some time. Talk about it. Be there for each other. And, um, and just don't think there's something wrong with you. So, which I, that advice that she gave in the 15 minutes she spent with us was so valuable to me. Um, because whenever I did something stupid or felt like it was stupid, I just, okay, I'm just getting through it. So um, that was a real. That was real special advice. Any any questions on um, evacuation or anything? Yeah. You talked about going back to work. How long before your company wanted to be back to work? Oh, Kyle, you know, I was going to put this in my comments, but I didn't, But but because I'm a little bit angry about this. So the next day, September 12th, um, my boss is the CFO of our business, and he calls me and he's checking on me. And I'm like, Bill, thank God we didn't go in today. I 
I'm a basket case. I couldn't have done it. He's like, oh, well, I'm calling to see if you can come in tomorrow. <laughs> and, you know, I was just, I always say, yeah, yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir, I'm going to have another. Like, okay, I'll come in. So, so we went in because we had Citigroup had its earnings call. So we had to report to corporate how we did. And they're like, oh, we're going to take it easy. Don't, we know what you guys have been through. We understand. So three or four of us on the call with the CFO, these guys start asking real pointed questions. Like, that was the analysis we would have had if we weren't running for our lives, you know. So um, it wasn't, look, they had to do the earnings call. They needed our information. But I was not, it wasn't the city group's finest hour in my personal opinion. Yeah, so I mentioned Mark, my wife's cousin, who um, was missing four years. Anybody who was down there saw this. Any wall in lower Manhattan was covered in pictures like this. And it was hard to walk past it because Every one of them is a story, right? You can only absorb so much pain and anguish. Every one of them had hundreds of people who were devastated by them being the same. And um, that was real sad. I wanted, so 2005, my brother, my nephew, Patrick, right, Jackie? Patrick sailed with us? Yeah, my nephew, Patrick. My father and I had bought a sailboat, sailed it up, stayed in New York overnight, we're going to sail the next day to Connecticut. So my brother and my nephew and I go to New York, and I'm giving, it's basically this talk, but I'm walking around, and I'm showing, I'm like, yeah, this is where I stood, this is where I ran, this is where this landed, and, and we walk past the fire department that was right in the shadow of the World Trade Center. And they have all these plaques for the guys who died on that day. And I think it might be the same fire department as to where the French uh, filmmakers were kind of focused on. It is, but yeah. And, you know, I'm, so, I'm, not, this is, I'm suffering from low testosterone. That's what the problem is here. This is not, <laughs> try, to, try not to be so emotional so many years later, but. I, I honestly, the firefighters and the police and the people with the look in their eye that was different than me who went into the fight, uh, tough to comprehend. And when you see 12 plaques, fire department, tiny little thing, it's unbelievable how, many, how much loss they had. So um, yeah, that's, that is tough. Um, so seeing the plaques, seeing the missing people, just reminded you continually that, uh, about the tragedy. Yeah, so before you start, let's just, so I, I said it's hard to fathom that much pain. This is my wife's cousin, Mark Hindy. He worked at um, Kenneth Fitzgerald. He's the guy on the left there. Uh -oh. Okay, well, basically, Mark, everyone says this, right? Mark was the best. A six foot three, gregarious, bigger than life, just a great guy. Him and his brother are just big, funny, nice people, the best people. Uh, he was a walk-on pitcher at Vanderbilt, and his catcher, was one of his best friends, and he's in the video. And they showed him on ESPN, wherever, game night, uh, his friend was catching, and he had Mark's number on his shoulder in, in remembrance. So this video is two of Mark's friends talking about what a great guy he was, what the loss meant to them, how they heard, etc. So that, 
that gets me every time. Um, so, trust me when I tell you, it, it, it's, uh, yeah, it's heavy, but it's important. It's important to put names and faces because it's so overwhelming. So, let me, let me uh, stop. Can anything else pick it that I know we... Yeah, I don't know if, um, I, if, if you're downtown, I would do the World Trade Center uh, Museum. It's really good. There's a special room, a uh, smaller room where they don't let kids because it's too heavy. Uh, I was there on a day it was so busy that I couldn't settle. I couldn't absorb it. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll probably go back. But um, anyways, any kind of final questions? I got one simple one. Yeah. Did you experience at any point this uh, phenomenon where things slow down and kind of go into a slow motion visually or in your mind? I mean, in auto accidents and things like that, you'll have that experience. Yeah, I, I think I did. I think, I think each of the major, so on the first impact, my brain solved it for what it was. I was wrong, but like, by the time I turned around, which was a split second, I was already, had already processed what it was, how it could be, and the whole thing. So, so yeah, I think it definitely did um, happen a number of times. There's this question in the back. Yeah, I have a question. Um, the, the time of you evacuating until, you know, you got several blocks away, were the news media outlets already there, or was it too soon after? <coughs> and if yes, have you ever seen yourself on any so I did not see myself on a documentary. I did not really see news. When I was down there, there was a lot of uh, helicopters. So, and that was part of like, what am I doing here? These helicopters, I can watch this all day if I want. So I don't need to stay. But I didn't see anything on the ground. Um, again, there's some amazing uh, photography that was, was captured with it. in that, that dust cloud was, you see people, the fear of God coming through them as that cloud came. Yes? I was curious to know the people that you experienced this with as you move forward in the time goes on. Is this something that other people don't want to talk about when like, they see you and they're with you and they don't want to talk about it? Or is it something that connected you together so deeply that you share and talk about it? So, the people I was with, for the most part, were, um, you know, I'd say half of my buddies. Uh, but honestly, at this point, 23 years later, um, I don't really talk to those folks. They're big shots and such. So, um, yeah, I think everybody's kind of get further and further apart. But I can tell you that uh, one of my buddies is, um, his wife, and I, I forgot to mention this, but we had a call train, so we finally got through on a, on a pay phone. And I think people here, do you know pay phones? <laughs> so like, museum. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so we finally got through a pay phone, and the guy who was sprinting out of the building first from my floor with a look of fear in his eyes, he gets through, and somebody had the bright idea to make a call train for like, there was like seven numbers. Mm -hmm. He calls his wife. We're on a pay phone, so I'm thinking like, all right, we're recording in three minutes, I don't know. And his wife is hysterical. And I can hear him trying to say, honey, you like, stop, stop, John, shut up, you gotta stop. <laughs> and, and I'm like, man, he's really trying to get her to calm down, but I started to become a little bit of New York, and after a while, I was like, you better calm down, because we need to get this call tree to you. So it ended up working out, and um, uh, Mindy, my friend's wife, called, had never met my wife, just, Judy, my name's Mindy. Your husband and my husband are together, they are safe, and they are walking, they're trying to figure out how to get out of the city. So, but I think, you know, Jackie, to your question, people do talk about it. I was at dinner two weeks ago with a, a guy, kind of a partner firm we work with, and September comes up, right? And he says, yeah, I went out September 10th with college buddies or whatever, or client maybe, and he goes, I got all banged up, and I was too hungover to get on my flight out of Boston. 
<laughs> he's sitting next to me at dinner two weeks ago. And he's and he put you know, so I I, I think people I think people are pretty willing to share. But again, most of the stories are like mine. I didn't run for my life much or do anything wrong. Like so it's not maybe if somebody had a really traumatic one, it might be different, but Oh my goodness. So, I was, yeah. My wife, um, my wife was home and she heard from Mindy. Uh, actually, before she heard from Mindy, my son's year and a half and four, they're all playing. My mother in law calls, turn on the TV. And at first, she says, Did Bill go to work already? She's like, Yeah, he went in early. And she's like, All right, don't be alarmed. But, and so, and a lot of people in the family just knew World Trade Center, right? Like, I don't know if you knew I was in seven World Trade, right? So, uh, so anyways, Judy puts my son on a pack and play thing, and my other son just plays well by himself, and she goes up and she's watching on TV. She comes down after a while to check on him, and the boys were watching PBS, and, uh, whatever show was on. But PBS flipped over to the news. So now my kids are sitting there watching burning buildings and planes flying into buildings. And she was like beside herself. But what are you going to do? So when she heard from Mindy, she took the kids, filled up the car with gas, packed the bag for everybody to plug out because she was going to drive to Rochester. If something happened, she wanted us to be ready to go. Because how far is this going to go? Still don't know. Are we at war? Like, what's happening here? So we were coming to visit you all. <laughs> and, and so she was doing all the right things, and she stopped for ice cream with her two little boys. And these kids, teenagers, young teenagers, go riding by on their bicycles. And my wife is Sicilian, is the same. These boys go by her and they're like, oh my God, the world's coming to an end and this lady's eating ice cream. <laughs> and she told me uh, this weekend, she goes, if I could rip that kid off his bike today, I would rip that kid off his bike. So that's what Sicilian so matters. <laughs> so, um, you know, it was hard for my wife. Uh, and you know, one of the things about uh, my four-year-old, and, and I, I looked for this, because it really it kind of, was a memento in a weird way, but he drew a picture, September 12th, 13th, or 14th area, of skyscrapers on fire, planes flying into them, fire trucks trying to put the flames out, um, debris falling and all that stuff. And we, and we saw accounts, we're like, hey, is this okay? He started to take his blocks, and he'd build a skyscraper, and then he would build a slide so people could get out of the skyscraper. He was giving them a, like a path. This is his play. So, but the, the um, therapist said, you know what, as long as he's acting it out in a constructive way like that, that's a good thing. So I kind of think it's almost like I have not willing and able to talk about it, not always easy, but, but I, I do it. I think he was kind of acting it out and telling the story in his own way, too. So, I miss the other story, too. <laughs> no, I don't think so. I don't think so. Bill's game. Bill's game. One of them. Any, uh, any other questions? Yes? Well, Mr. Goldman, uh, thank you. Thank you very much for, for, for doing this because the words never forget are starting to wear off. And it's one thing that we always have to never forget that we forget. And without people like you coming forward and talking about this stuff, nothing can talk about. It's history. It's and it's it's kudos to both the alumni association and struggle people for coming up with the There's a lot of 9-11 uh, people here in this county that were experienced somehow through what of the stuff. Uh, one of them is a lady and her husband lived over in Martin, uh, John and Nora Coco, or uh, Stephen and Nora Coco. Her brother was a lieutenant at the FDNY in Paris. And we get together with them at least once a year at one of the National Fallen Firefighters uh, Foundation events. And it's good to have her there as a survivor, basically. Um, 
Yeah. Yeah. That was a buzzword in 2001. That was real. Can you imagine everybody affected by the police in the mess? First Everybody went through it being affected by that. What it did to their life. Yeah. One of the big things right now is 343 New York City Fire Repairs Post 9 11, the numbers up at 363 additional firefighters in the past. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, there was some bad stuff that they went through. The people that were down there, I don't know what the civilian casualties are, the people that were exposed to the dust and the debris and stuff like that. So, you know, this was a far region effect that, you know, I hope that we're having. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very yeah. much for keeping it alive. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. And, and well said. Yeah, no, I totally, totally agree. You need to keep it alive. Um, and, uh, yeah. Yeah, Brandy. You say that, you know, the heroes died that day. Um, and the heroes had a bigger uniform than the police. Yeah. And you wear the heroes uniform because you are out there. Uh, that is probably the nicest thing anyone's ever said to me. It was very nice, thank you. Um, I, I'm, uh, I'm going to choose, uh, I, I, I take the appreciation of, of your comment and his to heart. I'm glad I did it, I'm glad Jerry asked me, I'm glad you all, all had me. Um, and, I, and you said PTSD. This, I, and I, this is, I have like a glimpse of what it is. Now imagine you're fighting in Fallujah, door to door every day. And like, what I did was like child's play. So I've always been super appreciative of first responders and the military and such. Oh.